Thanks a lot. Can people hear me? Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, we just had a talk about differential privacy, uh, but I think um, let's try to introduce the things again in case uh, you skipped the first one or didn't notice. Um, so I think it's, when I think about differential privacy, uh, I think it's often best described uh, by Cynthia Dork in this short quote. So she was one of the inventors of differential privacy. And she stated that the idea would be a new approach to, formulate, to formulating privacy goals, where the risk to uh, anyone's privacy, or in general, any type of risk, should not substantially increase as a result of participating in a statistical database. Um, so this is captured by differential privacy. Okay. So in recent years, uh, kind of since it was introduced in 2006, uh, differential privacy has really attracted a lot of attention, um, both in research, there's been like, tons of papers written about this, and also beyond, as companies try to uh, think about deploying this idea in practice, okay? Um, so, so what is differential privacy? Oops, uh, it's a broken computer. Uh. Okay, so I just had a definition. There used to be a picture here that was showing like the mechanism, but it's okay. Uh, so the basic idea is that uh, differential privacy is a property of a randomized algorithm, sometimes called a mechanism. And this algorithm takes in a database as input and produces a randomized output in some range, okay? And the idea is that if I have a database, uh, I can think about it as consisting of a bunch of records of different individuals. And now if I consider two databases that differ in a single individual's record, then the two resulting distributions on outputs should be similar. Okay? So more formally, this is the original definition by Dwork, McSherry, Nissim, and Smith. Uh, so first, the definition is parameterized by two parameters, epsilon and delta. These are, um, say, non-negative real numbers. Um, and we suppose that there's a relation called adjacency on databases, saying like, you know, these two databases are close or they differ in a single person's record. Uh, then a randomized algorithm M is going to be epsilon delta differentially private if for every set of outputs, I'll call it S, and every pair of adjacent databases, D1 and D2, we have this condition on the probability, right? So reading this, it says that the probability of landing inside S when you look at the output from the first uh, database is at most e to the epsilon times the probability of landing in S uh, when you look at the second uh, kind of, uh, the run on the second database plus this additive term delta. Okay, um, so this is like a perfectly fine definition and kind of almost as soon as it was proposed, uh, people started wondering, you know, can we actually formally verify, you know, this property? How can we check that this property holds of some algorithm? Okay, so this is the, one of the main questions I'm gonna be talking about today. I mean, we are certainly not the first people that propose formal verification, um, but uh, we wanna to try to extend and see what kind of algorithms we can verify, okay? So to date, uh, almost all of the formal verification approaches are based on this uh, composition, uh, sorry, this composition theorem here. Uh, this is a basic property of differential privacy, and it really makes easier to think about differential privacy kind of just informally and also in a formal way. Okay, so like whether you think about it just on paper or you're trying to verify this property. And roughly this property says that, uh, suppose that I have two mechanisms, uh, these orange uh, boxes here. Uh, suppose that the first one is epsilon delta private and the second one is epsilon prime delta prime private. And now I have a private database, this kind of blue circle, and I'm gonna feed it into the first, uh, the, the first mechanism. I'm gonna get some output and I'll feed the output along with the database again into the second mechanism, uh, which will then compute the final output, okay? Uh, so this composition property states that if I run these two kind of mechanisms in sequence, kind of this first orange uh, hexagon and then the second orange uh, block, I guess, uh, then the result will be epsilon plus epsilon prime and delta plus delta prime private, right? So informally, you could think of the epsilons and deltas as adding up through sequential composition, okay? Uh, so more formally, this is just the same thing, um, but this kind of composition property makes it a lot easier to analyze private algorithms uh, because you can imagine having a big algorithm and breaking it down into a lot of smaller pieces, analyzing each piece separately, and then adding up all the epsilon and deltas to compose everything together. Okay, um, does that make sense? 
Okay. Um, so to kind of summarize uh, kind of the existing technologies, generally speaking, um, they all work quite well when the privacy proof follows from composition. Okay, so when privacy follows from composition, the situation is very good. Um, everything is great. So what by that mean, like there's been many, many approaches that have been used to verify differential privacy using a range of techniques like linear types or refinement types or many other techniques. And these all work quite well when the privacy proof follows by uh, composition. Okay. However, when the privacy proof does not follow by composition, which there are a few algorithms where the known privacy proofs do not follow by this composition principle, the situation is, is not so great, okay? So it's, it's pretty tough. Um, there's not been so much formal verification work uh, for verifying these kinds of private algorithms. And this is really too bad uh, because even on paper when people prove these algorithms private, these proofs are often the most complex, okay? So since these privacy proofs do not follow from this clean composition principle, uh, they often are involving some ad hoc reasoning or a lot of reasoning about probabilities, and these proofs can be quite complex and quite subtle. Okay, so here I have a picture of this uh, privacy proof for a mechanism called above threshold. Um, this is proposed a long time ago, but uh, there have been kind of many versions of this algorithm, some of them that are kind of correct and some of them that are not correct. Okay, so on the right, uh, here's a survey uh, where uh, these, these people gave you know, six versions of this mechanism. They're all slightly different, kind of highlighted in the different colors. Um, at some point in time, all of these six versions were believed to be proved private, but after closer inspection, uh, only three of these were actually actually private. So three of these are not private. Okay, so uh, we, we really want to know, like, how can we verify, you know, kind of these proofs that use techniques beyond composition? So four of them are not private. Four of them are not private. Okay. It's unclear. It, the, the chart seems to say C3, but. Three, four, five, six, uh, three. Okay. I'm not sure. It says on there like four is. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, three, four, five, six are not private. Okay, so many of these are not private. Okay. <laughs> yes, the number is, is unclear. Uh, that, that, yeah, okay. Um, okay. So uh, there's been recent progress. Uh, we had some recent work earlier this year uh, that gave kind of some of the first pr formal proofs of privacy for mechanisms that were beyond composition, okay? And uh, I just want to briefly summarize this work. Uh, I relied on this uh, connection that we proposed um, showing that differential privacy can be seen as an approximate notion of a probabilistic coupling. Uh, so I'll present this in a bit more later. Um, and then using that connection, uh, we also showed that approximate couplings correspond in a particular sense to proofs in this logic APRHL, which I will also present. Um, and given these connections, uh, we were able to kind of ver verify privacy for one of these versions of above threshold. Okay. Uh, however, the only proofs we considered uh, were proofs beyond composition for epsilon zero privacy. So we did not consider any uh, mechanisms that uh, involve epsilon delta privacy where there are kind of more techniques beyond composition for proving. So that will be a focus of uh, the, some of the stuff I'll talk about today. Um, so the basic idea uh, will be to kind of uh, enhance the logic APRHL uh, by giving kind of new constructions of couplings, which I'll introduce in a second. Uh, these will lead to kind of new proof rules and these new proof rules will enable richer pr formal proofs of privacy. Okay, so this is the, the rough plan. Uh, kind of more concretely, uh, there's kind of three, I think of our work as presenting three kind of so somewhat mostly orthogonal uh, ways for reasoning about privacy beyond composition. Uh, the first one is uh, what we'll call accuracy dependent privacy. Uh, this is when the privacy guarantee depends on some accuracy bound. Uh, the second kind of tool, tool we want to support uh, is the advanced composition theorem. This is a more refined version of the composition theorem uh, I, I briefly sketched before with the, block, with the boxes. And finally, uh, we want to support mechanisms or algorithms that have adaptive inputs, so where inputs, uh, later inputs can depend on earlier outputs. So today I'll mostly talk about kind of the first two of these for lack of time, um, but we consider all three of these, or kind of in the, in the picture it's like three A's. Okay. So before I talk about these features, I want to give some brief background about uh, logic APRHL and also about approximate couplings to kind of explain wh where we're starting from. So this will be like kind of a really brief crash course on this logic. Uh, so APRHL is a program logic. So first I'll talk about the language. And the language itself is very simple. It's a basic imperative language with one extra new command for random sampling that looks like this. Okay, so this command says that uh, we're going to take a sample from the Laplace distribution, which is a specific distribution, uh, with mean E and parameter, parameter epsilon, and we're going to store the random sample into this variable X. Okay, 
Uh, so besides this command, the rest of the language is, is completely standard. So there's like conditionals, there's assignments, sequential sequencing, and also loops. Uh, we have this extra sampling command. And now APRHL stands for Approximate Rela Probabilistic Relational Horror Logic. So it's really a lot. And this is, I should say, this is an existing logic. We do not propose this new logic. Um, and the judgments in this logic look like, like this. Okay, so it's uh, inspired by horror logic. Or it's like a horror style logic. So phi and psi represent kind of a precondition and a postcondition. These are assertions. Uh, however, it's relational, so it talks about two runs. So we have two programs, C1 and C2. And roughly, we want to make statements about how these two programs are related. Okay, these two programs are related. Okay, so to talk about the assertions, uh, phi and psi are non-probabilistic uh, and relational assertions. So for instance, I put x1 equals x2. Uh, so these assertions can talk about two different memories. Um, and so this, this assertion here should be read as saying like, on the first run, um, we have some value x, and this is equal to the value of x on the second run. Okay, so the, these are kind of the formal assertions. And there's also these two numeric indices, epsilon and delta, okay? So, so okay, so these are the form of the judgment, um, and I will wanna briefly cover like what this judgment actually means for like, you know, what does a valid judgment mean in this logic, okay? This makes sense so far? Okay. So th to give like a meaning to these judgments, uh, I need to introduce this concept which we'll call approximate couplings. Uh, these are originally called approximate liftings. Uh, but the idea is that uh, we have a set A, okay, and we have a binary relation on, on A. So we, have a, we think of this relation R, which is kind of a subset of pairs of, of A's, okay? And then suppose that we have these two parameters, epsilon and delta. Uh, we can say that, and now we have these two distributions, mu1 and mu2, that are distributions over A, and we want to talk about kind of how they are related, okay? So we say, like, there, we say that there exists an epsilon delta approximate coupling uh, between these two distributions with support R. Uh, if there exist two distributions, mu L and mu R, and these are distributions over pairs of A's uh, that satisfy the following properties. So the first property is that mu L and mu R should have support in R. So they should only put non-zero probability mass on pairs that satisfy R, okay? The second property is that, roughly speaking, mu L should model mu1 and mu R should model mu2. So this second property says that the first projection of mu L is equal to mu1, and the second projection of mu R is equal to mu2. Um, and finally, uh, we have a third condition uh, that states that there's a distance condition between mu L and mu R, okay? So for every set of uh, pairs of outputs S, uh, we have this condition, which looks quite like differential privacy that I showed before, uh, but now it's kind of on pairs of outputs. Right, so uh, kind of the probability of landing inside S on mu L is at most e to the epsilon times the probability of landing in S on mu R, plus again this additive term delta, okay? And uh, just for notational convenience, we'll r often write um, the, this thing as this. So we'll say like this, this kind of statement says that there exists an epsilon delta approximate coupling uh, of these two distributions mu1 and mu2 with support in R, okay? This is like quite a technical definition, but this is like the key definition to kind of understand the previous judgment. So to interpret these judgments, uh, roughly we will say that, okay, we'll suppose that we have two memories that are related by phi. These are the two input memories for these two commands. And so this judgment will be validated for every two memories related by phi. The two output distributions are related by kind of an epsilon delta approximate coupling with support psi, okay? So kind of to give more, a slightly more concrete example, uh, we can show how to interpret differential privacy in this logic. Um, this is what it looks like. So uh, yes, so this says that kind of for any two uh, memories with two adjacent databases, that's the precondition, um, the kind of the resulting distributions are related by an epsilon delta approximate coupling with support res1 equals res2. Okay, so kind of unfolding definitions, this just means that C is epsilon delta differentially private. Okay. All right. Um, and I'll say, briefly say a few things about the proof rules before kind of getting to uh, the stuff that we extend. Um, so I'm not gonna show all the proof rules of APRHL because there's a lot and because uh, it's kind of not possible to present here, but the basic idea is that each proof rule in this logic corresponds to a recipe to combine couplings. So given a couple of couplings for maybe kind of sub parts of the program, each proof rule gives a way to combine these couplings into a larger coupling. Uh, so for instance, 
uh, the sequential composition rule kind of corresponds to the standard composition principle in privacy. So the sequence rule looks like this. Uh, kind of, it looks very similar to the normal sequence rule in Hoare logic, uh, kind of except everything's relational, we have these extra parameters. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, kind of, again, we have this property where the epsilon deltas kind of add up, right? So in the first premise, uh, we have an epsilon delta approximate coupling. In the second premise, we have an epsilon prime delta prime approximate coupling. And the conclusion, we have kind of, we just sum up the epsilons. Um, so morally, this, this rule represents the sequential composition theorem of privacy, where it kind of generalizes it. Okay. All right, so that was all kind of still background material, and now I'm going to get into kind of the new extensions we make this logic to en enable kind of uh, more advanced pri proofs of privacy. Okay, so again, these are kind of the three things that we want to extend uh, this logic with, uh, and I'll talk about the first two things mostly. Okay, so the first thing is accuracy-dependent privacy. Um, so a rough intuition, which we also heard in the first talk, is that, you know, what does epsilon delta privacy mean? So especially what does the delta mean, right? So you can interpret this delta parameter as a failure probability. It's saying that kind of, you know, delta is like some probability of privacy not holding, and with probability one minus delta, we have privacy, okay? So you can also read about like epsilon delta privacy as saying, you know, this algorithm is going to be, you know, epsilon differentially private, uh, except with some small, small probability delta. So using this reading, uh, we can use this probability delta to model kind of various ways that the algorithm can go bad, okay? So for instance, if the noise added is too large, maybe we have no privacy guarantee, uh, or you might consider other properties that, you know, have low probability, uh, but uh, if they don't happen, then the, the algorithm is private. So this style of reasoning is very similar to what people use in also cryptographic proofs, uh, where they sometimes call this kind of reasoning up to bad reasoning, right? So the main idea is that I have some bad event um, that hopefully happens with small probability, and if this bad event does not happen, then my protocol is safe, or yes, okay? So it's very similar uh, style uh, of, of reasoning. And we can model this kind of reasoning uh, in APRHL, okay? So with with a, this is the proof rule. So I'll try to step through this slowly because there's a lot going on here. Um, the first thing to see is that, kind of looking at the premise, uh, we have this uh, pr uh, predicate psi. I've indicated psi one uh, to indicate that it only mentions the memories on the first side. And roughly, this is the bad event, okay? This is the thing that we don't want to happen, okay? So this assertion states that, you know, if psi one does not happen, then we have x1 equals x2. And kind of by our reading before, x1 equals x2 means that uh, we have differential privacy. Okay, so if the bad event doesn't happen, we have differential privacy. Okay, so that's the first part of this rule. Uh, the second part is that we need to bound the probability of this bad event. Okay, and that's this second premise, which is saying that, you know, this bad event uh, happens with probability at most delta prime. Okay. And kind of combining these two pieces, we can use this kind of up to bad style reasoning uh, to show that uh, in, in the kind of thing, conclusion, we've proved x1 equals x2 in, in the post condition, which means we have differential privacy. And this delta prime, this kind of this probability of the bad event is absorbed into the delta parameter in the, in the conclusion. Okay, so this rule kind of uh, models uh, up to bad reasoning for differential privacy. Okay, is it clear? Okay, so I'll go on to talk about another extension we make, kind of uh, the second extension we make uh, to model kind of richer privacy proofs, and this is based on the, the Vance composition theorem. So, Vance composition. So, like we said before, uh, there's a standard composition theorem for differential privacy, uh, which goes something like this. So, suppose we have n mechanisms, n private algorithms, and say each one is epsilon delta private, and we want to run all of these things together in sequence. So, we run the first one, then the second one, and so on. Kind of later runs can depend on earlier runs. By standard composition, kind of the small block picture I showed before, this whole composition is n times epsilon and n times delta private. Okay, so kind of all the epsilons and deltas just add up, and we do this n times. Okay. Um, so this is the composition theorem used by essentially, uh, as far as I'm aware, like almost all formal verification techniques for privacy. Uh, but there's a kind of a richer composition theorem in the theory of differential privacy called advanced composition. Okay, so this provides uh, kind of the composition is still the same. We're still trying to run this mechanism n times, or kind of n, you know, n of these things in sequence. Uh, but we want to give a different analysis of this of the privacy cost of this composition. Okay, so the advanced composition theorem states that. Uh, if I run the, the, like 
these n mechanisms, it's going to be epsilon star delta star private, where epsilon star is going to be roughly root n epsilon, and delta star is kind of n delta plus delta prime. So I'm putting approximately because the, the true numbers are kind of uglier, uh, but this is kind of morally what's going on. And I just want to point out that kind of the difference between these two composition theorems is that they give a different trade-off between epsilon and delta, okay, these two parameters. So kind of in standard composition, we have kind of the n epsilon uh, private. And advanced composition, we have this root n epsilon. So kind of for advanced composition, um, the epsilon part of the, the privacy is smaller. And smaller means kind of more private. Uh, however, the delta is kind of switched, right? So in standard composition, it's n times delta private, whereas under advanced composition, we have this extra bit of delta prime that we have to add. Okay, so roughly I've exchanged some of the epsilon for some delta using the advanced composition theorem. Okay. Um, so we'd like to kind of introduce this principle also into the logic, uh, again, as a proof rule. And the proof rule looks something like this. So we call it AC for advanced composition, and it's really just a, a rule for the while loop, okay? So for this while loop, we'll assume that the while loop executes at most n iterations, and say it's like a for loop, say. Um, and we'll also assume throughout uh, that kind of under the loop invariant theta, the two guards are equal. So now the, the main premise on the top right shows that the loop bodies are related by an epsilon delta approximate coupling. And now by applying advanced composition, we have the two loops are related by an epsilon star and delta star uh, approximate coupling, where these epsilon stars and delta stars are kind of roughly what I showed before on advanced composition. Um, so when we actually showed this rule, uh, it was actually somewhat surprising uh, because this rule is actually more than the advanced composition theorem. It's actually a generaliz generalization to approximate couplings. So I mean, a priori was not clear whether you know, this rule was even true uh, or whether you could generalize this composition theorem beyond privacy. Uh, and a bit more surprising, uh, at least to me, was that the privacy composition theorem, the one I showed on the previous slide, kind of directly generalizes to this richer setting of approximate couplings. Um, so using this connection, uh, we anticipate in the future if, we, if someone comes up with you know, different kinds of composition rules, uh, it's very easy to generalize them directly to approximate couplings. So just proving it for privacy is enough. Okay. Okay, so I haven't shown an example of actually how to use all these things, uh, but I can give like a, a brief taste of an example. I won't have time to go through like the whole example or explain clearly what it's doing in all detail. Uh, but the main example we consider is uh, one example that covers all three uh, kind of use cases or three extensions that we made, okay? And this is called the between thresholds algorithm. Uh, so it's actually a, a slight variant of a mechanism by uh, these people, uh, Bun, Stanky, and Ullman. It's a very recent algorithm. They only, I believe they proposed it maybe last year, but it's maybe only published this year. And it looks, it looks something like this. Um, I won't be able to go through the details of exactly what it does, but roughly you have a kind of a stream of queries, and you want to return approximately the first query that has answered between two thresholds, kind of in some interval, okay? Uh, so using the extensions that I sketched and additional extensions, uh, we formalize epsilon delta privacy for this algorithm inside EasyCrypt, uh, so proof assisted. Um, and so the, the privacy proof, like we focus on this example because it kind of combines many examples uh, in one, many of these features in a single example, though kind of each of these kind of features are, we would expect are you know, useful independently also. Uh, so we have accuracy-dependent privacy and advanced composition, like I discussed, but we also have, uh, have to handle like adaptively chosen inputs, and we have this subset coupling construction that I thought was quite nice. Uh, so please see the paper for more details about kind of these last two things and about kind of all four things, because I'm going very quickly here. Uh, so kind of just to brief, uh, quickly overview, uh, so our work is supporting uh, formal privacy proofs with kind of these advanced features. So accuracy-dependent privacy, uh, the advanced composition theorem, and also supporting algorithms that have adaptive inputs. So we're, like later inputs may depend on earlier outputs in kind of a streaming setting. Okay, uh, so that's all I have, thanks. <laughs> Please come up to the mic and state your name and affiliation. Don't, don't be shy, especially for students in the audience. It's a great time to ask uh, questions for Justin. Maybe I can begin with one as you think about questions. Please go. So first, I want to clarify that uh, three or four issues. So one of the algorithm uh, is uh, differential private, but not epsilon, but for uh, many yeah. times epsilon. So I consider it not private because yes. it's not as claimed. Uh, so another question I have is, uh, 
So have you tried uh, applying the proof to, uh, for example, the algorithm that are not private, and then if you do, then where does it start? So yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we definitely haven't applied it to all of the all of the proofs. So the most interesting, the one that most interesting is the algorithm three. So that's because the reason is not private, it's a little bit subtle. Is that the one that releases the answer also? Yeah. The yeah. Answer. So we, we've thought about this, and it's uh, so I didn't have time to kind of sketch the proof, um, unfortunately. But it's quite clear where it goes wrong. I mean, it doesn't show that it's not private. Uh, it just shows that the obvious proof that you try will fail. And then you could think, maybe I need something fancier, or you, you can try to prove that it's not private, like you guys did. Uh, but it was quite clear where it would fail. Yes? Thank you. Justin, uh, can you comment on the limitations of your, uh, of your framework? Are there some important categories of proofs in the differential privacy ecosystem uh, that you're not able to currently handle? And, uh, what techniques could in future have in those cases? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any kind of broad categories of classes of proofs that we are not able to handle now, especially with these extensions. Um, but there are certainly like individual algorithms where people come up with a very ingenious proof that uh, we're not sure whether we can handle, or maybe we can't. So I'm aware of only like maybe a handful of algorithms where I don't know how to do it using this technology. And generally speaking, these algorithms are ones that have uh, very little code in some sense. Like uh, these are the algorithms that maybe just sample once and then do something very, very uh, complicated. Uh, and in, like this kind of uh, approach that I'm sketching is very nice for uh, larger algorithms where you're trying to do some kind of compositional reasoning. And if you kind of you're only sampling once, it's a little bit difficult to do this compositional reasoning. Um, but it's not to say that the, you know you definitely could not do these algorithms that just sample once. It's that maybe you need a more clever encoding of the algorithm. So for example, against this kind of uh, previous work, uh, but for the exponential mechanism, which people usually think of a single sample from some distribution, uh, there's like an equivalent formulation of this mechanism that is more compositional, that kind of adds noise to each possible range element and selects the maximum one. And by rewriting the algorithm in this form, we're able to give a privacy proof of that exponential mechanism inside uh, this logic. Uh, whereas a, a priori would seem like you would need to do something uh, by looking at directly the semantics of this one sampling command, uh, which is also possible, but uh, more painful, let's say. Can you go, uh, Marco Flora is from Microsoft Research. Can you go to slide 15? I just want to stay a bit more at the approximate coupling definition. Uh, yes, sorry, I went through this very quickly. Yeah, I can find it. Yeah, here. So, um, what was pi, pi one? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, so it wasn't bound, but maybe I just didn't have enough time. For yes, you know, I, I always like forget to introduce notation. So pi one is, uh, so mu, mu L mu R are distributions over pairs of outputs, and pi one and pi two are the projections, the probabilistic projections. So pi one is the distribution of the first components, yeah. and the pi two is the distribution of the second components. So I always assume that people yeah. know the notation, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, first and second components, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's thank Justin again. Great, thanks a lot.